great to see the, uh, the rain finally ceasing and uh, a warm welcome to uh, tonight. Um, I first of all thank uh, the Australian Centre for Christianity and Culture for providing this uh, venue to us to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the noble people, and uh, acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging and to also acknowledge the way in which those elders have been treated by their community, the respect in which they're held. I'll say a little about uh, Christians for an Ethical Society. Uh, this uh, is a group that's been going for about 13, 14 years in Canberra. It is ecumenical. It looks at the social and um, issues that uh, our society faces and reflects on them from a Christian, biblical and ethical perspective. Um, it seeks to engage in debate and tonight we'll have the opportunity to hear from um, two different people and I'll certainly introduce them in a minute, uh, but as a group Christian for an ethical society wants to engage with those complex issues that confront us as a society. Tonight we're looking at um, the recently released uh, report <coughs> on aged care and it's been entitled Neglect or Aging with Dignity. So we welcome you to this session. Um, the format will be um, Lynn Hatfield Dodds will speak for about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, Gordon Ramsay will respond, and then there'll be the opportunity to ask questions. We have about 25 people <coughs> online who are watching us uh, by Zoom tonight, and we welcome those <coughs> who are um, attending via Zoom. Lynn has had a, a very distinguished career. She's currently Associate Dean of the, uh, at ANZOG, which is the Australian New Zealand School of Government, which is part of uh, ANU. Prior to that, she was Deputy Secretary for Social Policy in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Uh, that was for three years. And prior to that, was uh, National Director of Uniting Care from 2002 to 2016. And Lynn has served on many, many boards, including the board of the Australian Centre for Christianity and Culture. But she has been President of the Australian Council of Social Service and Chair of the Australia Institute. Uh, she's a member of the National Place-Based Advisory Group providing advice to the Prime Minister and Minister for Families and Aged Care Sector Committee and advising the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Uh, Lynn was the ACT Australian of the Year in 2008 and received the Churchill Fellowship in 2003 and was awarded the Chief Minister's International Women's Day Award in 2002. We welcome Lynn and thank her for participating in tonight's forum. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, thank you, Clive. So I join with Clive in paying my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples um, who've lived in this country long, long, long before any of us non-Indigenous people arrived. So my deep respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I also want to say um, that was a, a lovely wrap and you'd think if I were more successful during the course of my working life we probably wouldn't be having this conversation today and perhaps we wouldn't even have needed a Royal Commission um, into <laughs> aged care because I did spend a lot of my time thinking and advocating and doing policy and practice work on aged care in the 15 years I was with um, Uniting Care Australia. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit of um, context I suppose before I start. So I want to give you, before I, I don't want to dive straight into the Royal Commission recommendations, I will come to them, I'm going to um, explore them a little bit and speak with, Gordon, can I feel, that is completely out of time, clearly I'm a new battery in my 
Watch. It's like, oh, that's not enough. Yeah, take mine. Okay. It's a scam. I'd like everybody's watch. <laughs> <laughs> and now you have to leave straight up at the door. <laughs> Thank you, Clive. <laughs> um, so I want to give you a bit of context um, to come at the reporting, because if you just look at the report without it, um, I don't think it'll make so much sense. Although the T-shirt slogan is the system is radically broken. We've been breaking it for 30 years and we need a fundamental rethink and reorientation of our aged care system and our attitudes to older people. But let's just park that over there and I'll tell you when you can put that T-shirt on. So I want to start with thinking about a structurally ageing population. Most of you are probably aware that we have one of those in this country. Um, the number of Australians aged 85 years and over will grow from 2% of the population in 2018-19 to 3.7% in 2058. I don't know who does these statistics because 2058 is a really weird year to pick, like when I want to go to 2060, but anyway, that is what the ABS does. But that's an increase of around 1 million people over 85. That's probably why they chose 58 to get the 1 million round this far. Um, but if you just, just think about that for a moment because I'm going to put a lot of propositions in front of you. So one is that, um, that we don't value older Australians. I actually think we're moving into a space where subsequent generations are starting to get cheesed off with older Australians. There you all sit, Australians over 65, with your cushy supers. Now that's not true actually, because most of you didn't have access, but that's what young pe younger people think. So people under 35, you've owned your own home, way too many of you, you've had holidays, you've had jobs, you haven't had split chef crappy casual jobs till you're 45. You walked into jobs when you left school or TAFE or university. So I think, I think we're starting to develop a bit of a two-track story about what it means to be Australians. And in an environment where we desperately do need to reform fundamentally our aged care system, um, we're gonna hit some cultural bumps along the way, I think. So, um, from the early 2000s, for the last um, 20 odd years, our Federal Department of the Treasury has regularly prepared an intergenerational report that some of you might look at, and it sets out the economic and structural challenges and opportunities that come with an ageing population in Australia. So for policy um, practitioners, this is not a new issue, the ageing curve, and the issue about aged care being under a lot of stress is not a, a new issue either. Um, over the past 15 years, you'd know we've had policy setting after policy setting that's encouraging or driven all working age Australians who can work, even if you can only work a small amount, into jobs. So at the same time, we've kept adjusting our education and skills policy settings to increase the length of time Australians stay attached to our education system and to encourage more prospective workers to train for high value jobs in places like STEM or rapidly growing jobs human services. So again, think NDIS or aged care. We need everyone who can work to work. We need them working and paying tax because the cost of supporting older Australians is rising rapidly. Part of that is about the increasing acuity or complex uh, need profile of older Australians who are needing care in the home and, uh, and who are moving into residential aged care. Hello, um, oh, Nice to see you. Um, these costs aren't just limited to aged care per se, of course, but include the hugely increased healthcare costs due to comorbidities associated with um, healthy or non-healthy ageing, so diabetes and, and things like that. So all of those numbers together um, represent a really significant portion, proportion of GDP, and I don't see any leader in any sector who's starting to make the cultural case for the kind of investments we're going to have to make very rapidly. So let's talk about ageing briefly. The great news is that on average, Australians are living for 25 years post-retirement. So it's good if your knees aren't crap. I've got arthritis in both knees at the age of 55. It's sad. Um, but it's 25 years to contribute, belong and be valued in different ways to full-time work. Um, again, where outside of churches and faith-based organisations, there are not too many um, stories we're telling each other about how to live meaningfully um, when you move beyond full-time work. And I have to say the most stunning thing for me in my time at PMC was the amount of senior people who literally could not conceive of a self or a worthy, valued, valuable self beyond full-time work, which I thought was really sad. 
Um, our retirement age in this country is low by global standards, um, sitting around the mid to late 50s. That's like super low. Many other countries, people are now working till they're 65 or 70 and required to by policy settings. We've had several governments over the last 20 years that have tried to shift the retirement age up and then an election comes along and it becomes contentious and it shifts down again. That is actually not going to serve older Australians well over the next 10 to 30 years. Um, We've got a superannuation scheme dating from the 1990s to supplement our age pension um, that requires those who can save for their retirement to do so. So in Australia, compared to um, other countries like ours around the world, we actually do retirement and re prepare for retirement um, fairly well. Uh, we've got a strong focus on positive and healthy ageing in Australia. We encourage people post-work or post-full-time work to be active volunteers in the community to stay physically active and connected to others. Because we know that retiring and retreating into your home um, and not being connected to meaningful activity with others is a one-way ticket to an early death. That's just all the evidence is in on that. Usually preceded by ill health and depression. So, so if you're not working, volunteer. Um, be part of a community, be active. Okay, let's talk about aged care for a sec. Um, only, not, not many Australians know this, but only about 7 to 8% of Australians will ever need to access residential aged care. But when we think about aged care, most of us think about residential aged care. And the profile of residential aged care has changed um, almost beyond recognition in the last 20 years. So when um, and residential aged care was pretty much invented by churches in this country, and um, when we brought it into being, it was really much more what retirement villages are now. Residential aged care were places where everybody was ambulant, where people could get together, where Alistair and I might go for a walk in the morning or have a cup of tea, I might go play croquet with somebody, whatever it is. But you've got to think differently now. Residential aged care settings look much more like hospitals than they do look like retirement villages. So most residents are in hospital type beds, the bit, you know, with the metal bits that go down and up. Um, and they they're mostly. They don't anymore. They don't? They don't. No. They just stay up? No. <laughs> in the light, it's, it's restriction. The legislation of last year? Ah. No. But people, people in aged care, yeah. um, residential aged care, are generally very frail with a bunch of comorbidities and they're not, they're not really active while they're in there. So, and, and in fact, there's a whole lot of Australians who are trapped in hospital care because they can't get a place in residential care. So we've got three broad tiers. One tier is the residential, um, if you think of that as a tertiary tier, residential aged care or nursing homes. Then we've got care in the home with more intensive support, so to help people live at home, and that can be weekly, daily, bi-weekly visits. Um, to help with cooking, taking medication, getting active, getting out of bed sometimes for people. And then the, the, the primary um, first tier um, are just supports in the home. So there'll be things like meals on wheels, assistance with cleaning, shopping, getting around to the doctor, that sort of thing. Um, I've told you that aged care originated with the churches. Just to let you know, I couldn't get stats, current stats on all the churches, but the two churches with the biggest footprint in aged care in this country are the Uniting Church in Australia and the Catholic Church in Australia. Um, and between, between the churches, um, the, those two churches deliver a bit over 20% of all residential aged care across Australia and around 13% of home care across Australia. The Australian Government's got a strong role in the regulation and quality control of the aged care services system and it's one of the few elements of human services in Australia that the Commonwealth Government has the major um, footprint and, um, and sort of licence over. Uh, but our aged care system, as most of you probably know, is opaque and very hard to navigate. Most Australians first navigated in crisis. Uh, you or a parent have fallen over and need to go into residential care immediately or require immediate support in the home. Very few of us actually plan um, for our aged care. So in terms of aged care, and I'm going to dive into the Royal Commission, there's, I think there's three key policy challenges and two opportunities. So the first key challenge, I think, is, is the reality that Australians don't value or respect old age. As a nation, we really don't want to think about getting old or about aged care, and that doesn't work in so many different dimensions. Second policy challenge is that funding aged care is challenging. Public policy is caught between the reasonable demands from the boomer generation for consistently high quality care with choice 
and the financial pressures of a high dependency ratio, older people to working people, retired people to working people. Um, this will remain a, potently, a potent political issue for at least a decade, given the stats. Third policy um, challenge is that our aged care system is under huge pressure as it shifts to consumer-directed care while at the same time trying to lift quality fast. We privatised a lot of aged care um, in the Howard government era um, and the only way really to manage that is by regulate, regulate, regulate and that's very difficult um, to do. Two opportunities though. The first one is that Australians are living on average for 25 years post-retirement. That's huge. There are a lot of people who will want to work for longer if we change our policy settings to advantage that choice for their retirement income. Um, all of us in this room, particularly in Canberra, will know public servants who retired at the unbelievable age of just under 55 because that maxed out their superannuations. That's a rational choice for that individual, but it's a mad policy setting uh, to still have in this country, given the dependency ratio. Um, and the, the second opportunity is just, um, I, think, and I think you can view this as a challenge or an opportunity. I'm an optimist, so I'm going with opportunity. With a structurally ageing population, um, we're being forced to rethink ageing and work and family and community. How do we manage those things of retirement and, and how we find meaning in our lives? We're being shaken out of a cultural rut and we know that this is the dynamic that produces innovation. So all the stuff we've been seeing and we are still in the middle of it at the moment around women and women's safety and abuse of women, the stuff we, keep, we hear every election around childcare, all of that is the same thing. How do we break out of a cultural norm that thinks about ourselves as people who live a linear life? We get born, we go to school, we might do a bit more education or not, but we end up in work. The cultural trope still is we do pretty much the same thing for our working life. That is not true for people 35 and under, but still the cultural trope. Then we retire and we garden, we do church stuff, we go bowling, we do whatever we do, and then, and then we die. Um, Nothing is that linear or easier anymore. The only way that looks linear is because that was mostly the pathway for men. Women mostly stayed home and didn't work because we weren't allowed to work for a long time. And um, children were just sort of kept in a cupboard somewhere, you know, <laughs> seen but not heard. So we've got this huge opportunity to blow all of that up and think about what does it mean to be an Australian in the coming decades? How do we want to live and work and play together in ways that confers dignity on every human person um, and maximises our, all of our opportunities to thrive. So, in the past 20 years, we've had more than 20 significant inquiries and reviews into the status of aged care, which have given rise to multiple recommendations across key areas. I'm giving you four key areas. Service quality, everybody talks about that. Service system reach, availability and funding. Workforce, so there's always workforce pressures. Are we paying people enough, are we skilling them up enough, where are we going to find our, um, our workforce? Um, we're going to need an, an extra, right now we need an extra 150 aged care workers to come online in the next five to seven years. Where are we going to get those people from? And fourth, putting consumers in the driver's seat, um, consumer directed care. That's been a recommendation consistently over 20 years. So we come to the current Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. So this, this Royal Commission was not actually a holus bolus review into everything about aged care, unlike some of those other reviews. So we had Living Longer, Living Better when, under the Labor government when Mark Butler was Minister, as I recall, um, 2012, I've written it down, I rock. Um, I can do detail when necessary. Um, but that, that, was, that was very much a broad look at the whole of ageing and aged care. This, is, this Royal Commission has really been about aged care quality and safety. So a little word of advice, if, please stop calling for Royal Commissions Australians. Yes, yes, they are specific yes. legal instruments that have specific um, capabilities and they're specifically bounded. So if you want to find out things about stuff like quality and safety, a Royal Commission's your, your tool, if you want to spend billions of dollars, if you think it's worth that, you might go for a different form of inquiry that's not so expensive. But Royal Commissions can't and necessarily don't really get into things like well-being and how we feel about ourselves and meaning. And I think all of that is tied as much to ageing and aged care as the issues around quality and safety. Yeah. We just get stuck on quality and safety, we're stuck in transactional land. Um, so in well, you know when it all started. Late 2018, the Australian Government announced a Royal Commission. Um, and, and I have to say, up until, up, until, up until then, up until 2018, 
It was very rare for Australia to have even one Royal Commission running. We're now in a world where we have several running, and whenever somebody in the public doesn't like something, they go, let's have a Royal Commission. Well, you can have Royal Commissions, because they're real easy things for Premiers and Prime Ministers to agree to, but you need to know they're spending, those Royal Commissions will suck up your tax dollars that could be used for really way more productive inquiries and even way more productive delivery on better quality of life for people, so don't ask for them. Um, so the Royal Commission was announced in the context of increasing public dissatisfaction with the quality of care available across Australian nursing homes. And if you cast your mind back three years, we were getting media report after media report after media report of people malnourished, of people neglected, of people abused, of people's fragile skin being torn, of bloody bandages in shower stalls. Like it just kept coming and coming and coming until, until the government had to, um, had to act. So two years later, the Royal Commission has delivered 148 wide-ranging recommendations in eight thick volumes. Who's read any of them? Nice work, nice, nice work, three of us. <laughs> so, so I think look, the take-home is reform is absolutely needed, not just to address the present needs and deficiencies in the current aged care sector, but to invest in its sustainability for the future. The aged care sector we currently have is not a platform that we're going to spring into the future um, together from. Remember, we've got a million extra Aussies over 85 and 35 years, and just in the next five years or so, we need another 150,000 extra workers in the current system, let alone a change system. We're not really thinking yet in a systemic way about the needs of older Australians from diverse backgrounds and cultures and those with special needs. Um, and there's way more of those Australians um, aged 60 and above, and that, that proportion will continue to rise. So we've really got a system that's set up around people for whom English is a first language, that kind of stuff. So we, we need to shift that, particularly we know as people move into dementia and other neurological issues as they age, people go back to their language of origin, their first language. They don't, they might have learned English in Australia at the age of 40 when they arrived here, but they're not going to remember it when they're 85 and in a nursing home. So we're going to see the extent of the Commonwealth Government's response to these recommendations in this year's budget. But the key recommendation themes um, are as follows. And I just have to note, the commissioners are split on a range of important issues. And um, <coughs> that, that was a very difficult decision, I'm sure, for them to come to. There's strong agreement between the two of them on the need for systemic transformation of our aged care system. But they differ on how to do it. And largely the difference is, do you run broadly, do you run with a more market approach to how you think about solving all these challenges? Um, and, and kind of have um, regulatory and other bodies that see a bit outside government, or do you locate your reforms very much in a spine of Commonwealth-owned and managed entities? Um, so I've got, I'm really sorry about this, there are 11 key themes, but there's a lot of recommendations, so, you know, if I had another month, I might have been able to bash them down first, but here we go. So I'm going to run through them, then give you a couple of sentences on each. People first, carers too. First Australians, regional, rural and remote, disability, get younger people out of nursing homes, sort the workforce, uh, do something about providers, fix funding, build back better, sector finances. Okay, now I'm going to talk about it really quick, really quickly because I've got one at the time. People first. So the, the recommendations cluster around um, Governance and the institutional, institutional arrangements and the Aged Care Act, and they're saying all of those things have got to put people at the centre. So we really want a people-focused, a people focused, people pivoting um, system. Recommendations about introducing a universal entitlement to quality aged care services based on need and not availability. So this all, think, have a think about how you might design this system. It doesn't look like what we've got now. A focus on safety, quality and continuous improvement of care and supports through new quality standards, indicators and a star rating system. Star rating is kind of important so that average Joe consumers like us can look and go, three stars, I'd like a five star but I'm not going near a one star. So that's people first. Carers too. Um, the recommendations are clustered around more support for families and carers and better defined roles for volunteers. First Australians. We need to develop culturally competent services for Indigenous Australians 
and we need to establish an Indigenous specific aged care pathway. It's really, really important. I visited loads of times um, aged care services all three tiers in cities, in regional, um, rural and remote Australian for Indigenous Australians and they are almost all without exception culturally incompetent so we have to lift our game in that regard and frankly if we get it right in aged care we might get it right in other places too which would be great. Four, regional, rural and remote we need to surprise surprise improve access um, and we need to expand the multi-service program so there's already a program out there and they're saying bulk that up and make that work. Uh, five, disability. Older people with disability are to, uh, the recommendation is they receive equivalent support to that on the NDIS that's available to them. So again, this all makes huge amounts of sense when you're a Royal Commissioner. Um, I look at that through budget eyes and go, whoa, I don't think any government's going to come near that for a while. So um, good luck with that recommendation. But it's, a, it's good policy. So we should, I say you definitely have it in the policy settings. Then we decide what we can prioritise out of these policy settings. Six, get younger people out of nursing homes. Um, young, young in this case is um, 65 years and under and then 45 years and under. So by 2025, by 2022, next year, no one under 45 years is the recommendation. By 2025, no one under 65 years. That's a fantastic recommendation and will increase a lot of people's quality of life. Seven, workforce. We need to develop skills, improve remuneration, invest in training and career pathways, develop better regulation and planning, um, and make mandatory minimum staffing levels. One of the changes that happened in the early 2000s is we stopped regulating much around staffing, uh, and that led to a lot of the crises we were seeing in the media, I think. My view, but it's a view. Eight, to think about my fingers, providers. We need better accountabilities and better regulation for providers of aged care with better enforcement, oversight and prudential arrangements. So I wholeheartedly agree with all of that, but Gordon, you have to have a view on that. Gordon has chaired a big Uniting Care board. If you overload providers with too much regulation, they're gonna exit the space. So a lot of churches have exited aged care. What comes in? Global for-profit companies. Yeah. Why? Because mm -hmm. you can harvest a hell of a lot of money mm -hmm. real fast in human services in Australia, then leave. Yeah. No skin off your nose because you're, you're based offshore. So this, I think it's a nonsense that um, privatising human services in Australia improves them. I think mm -hmm. some competition is a good thing, but are we really saying we can't see competition amongst for-purpose agencies? All the economists in the audience will hate me, but I just... I am not seeing, over three decades, the big improvements that we were promised from privatising human services generally and aged care in particular. Happy to be wrong, but I don't think I am. Um, nine, <laughs> funding. <laughs> We've got to develop a modern funding model overseen by an independent pricing authority. Again, show me the cabinet that's going to agree to that. Sure, let's have a bit of a budget untrammeled. Um, and we've got to focus very fast on sector sustainability issues. So it's really clear that a whole lot of current providers are exiting aged care because it is too challenging. Uh, Ten, build back better. We need to invest in research, technology and innovation. And we need to establish a national aged care data asset. Unbelievably, in 2021, we do not have a national data asset where we can go to to find out what we need to know about aged care writ large across the, um, across the country. And then number 11, sector finances. We need to phase out residential accommodation deposits, the recommendations go, for a more sustainable model of capital financing support for residential aged care. That's going to be massively contentious because those RADs are where um, providers actually get their capital to build and to sustain and where they get their surplus to do training. So a lot of these recommendations are not funded in the current system. Um, and we need to enact, or another recommendation, we need to enact an income tax levy to pay for a new aged care financing system to pay for these reforms. So instant hatred from the 40-year-olds and under. So these recommendations are not without their controversy, but what they are is a pretty holistic suite of recommendations to actually allow governments and public policy people consumers, citizens, communities to start thinking in a coherent way about what we need um, for aged care. I need to stop now, I had a whole section on how to drive system transformation, but you yeah, can ask me questions about that. Yeah. <laughs> ask me questions. Right. What, I, what I want to finish by just saying though is um, I'm optimistic about our capacity to navigate our ageing and ageing population in a way that strengthens our nations, our communities and our economy. 
if we choose to. Currently we're not choosing, we're not making these kind of choices. I'm way less sanguine about whether we will choose to prioritise the necessary investment in ageing and aged care in time to make the system step changes required to meet the needs of an ageing population. Commonwealth governments tend to focus strongly on national security and economic prosperity and not so much on social policy. Commonwealth governments are not really ace on social policy. That's kind of the states have more skin in that particular game. Um, so I'd suggest if you're thinking, well, what could I do? Here's a couple of things you could do. You might want to connect with your local federal member and ask them what their position is on aged care reform, what they think about the Royal Commission in particular, um, and what they're pressing Cabinet to consider in this year's budget. But let's not let providers off the hook, and particularly not church-based providers, given we're church-based people. Uh, most of our churches deliver aged care in one form or another. So you might want to start asking questions of your church's governing bodies about how your church is planning to respond to the Royal Commission's recommendations and visionary plan for the future. Churches don't need to wait for governments to act. The reason we have an aged care system is we didn't wait, we got on with it. We can be the path makers, we can drive system change. This is an area crying out for justice and for hope. So my question for you is, will you take action in your church for Press for Change? Thank you. Mm. <laughs> well, what a wonderful <coughs> overview of a very complex uh, matter. And thank you so much, Lynn. Um, it's, uh, it is it um, is uh, a report which, uh, along with the 19 or 20 previous reports, uh, <laughs> sits there. And uh, Lynn has given us um, not only uh, the essence of what's in um, the recommendations of the Royal Commission, but put it in a context, a broader social context. So thank you. I now invite uh, Gordon Ramsay to the podium. Um, Gordon has had a, a very significant, uh, made a very significant contribution to uh, the Canberra community well known as uh, the Uniting Church Minister at Kipax, who had a very significant social welfare ministry. Uh, he's not only been a minister in the church, he's also of course been a minister of the Crown as a, a representative in the House of, uh, in, in the uh, Legislative Assembly as Attorney General and uh, Minister for Seniors. And uh, he introduced the first elder abuse criminal provisions. Uh, Gordon has been a passionate advocate uh, for the rights of all people and is currently uh, providing advice to the Chief Minister in that area. So we welcome uh, Gordon and thank you for the contribution you're about to make to this forum. Thank you. Thanks, Clive, and thank you, Lynn, for the insights and for heading into some of the detail of uh, what it is that we are thinking about tonight. Um, ironically, it's, Lynn and I have worked together a lot over the years, and more often than not, Lynn does the high-level stuff, and I come in and do some of the detail. Tonight, we're flipping it round, and Lynn has got into the detail. I'm now deliberately going to be taking a step back and doing some reflecting work with us tonight. But as I start, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners, people who have been caring for this land, building community for many millennia, people who have been passing on their wisdom from generation to generation, from elder to elder. I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and I commit myself to ongoing acts of reconciliation with our nation's first peoples as well. A few years ago, there was another Royal Commission report a report from the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses for Child Sexual Abuse. Mm. After a few years of its work, it handed down 409 recommendations. 307 of them were in the responsibilities of states and territories, and the other 100 or so were in the responsibility of the federal government. When we uh, adopted, or we agreed to adopt all 307 here in the ACT, and I had the privilege at that time of 
uh, being involved in the announcement of agreeing in principle or agreeing to all 307. I made the point specifically that the response of the government, the response of the community, and the response that was coming out of the Royal Commission's work was, how is it that we effect cultural change because what we had was not good enough? Responding to the Royal Commission's work was about effecting cultural change. <coughs> At that stage, it was acknowledging that we as a community had let down our most vulnerable people. And we needed to own up to that fact that we had done that as individuals, as institutions, and as a society, and address the fact that those most vulnerable people here, children, vulnerable children in institutional life, we let them down and we needed to do something about it. Addressing issues of power, addressing issues of structure, addressing issues of the assumptions that we make about how it is that life should be lived. We need to change that. Now we have the Royal Commission into aged care and to its safety uh, specific uh, focus in the terms of reference there. And what we have now is the opportunity for us to think about how is it that we respond and effect cultural change? Our response to the way it is that we are thinking through our older camp barons, our older Australians, is about how is it that we change the way that society works in the way that we owned up to the fact that we needed to do that also with our children a few years ago, and it's still ongoing. What is it about society that has allowed society to get to the fact point where we need the sorts of systemic and systematic and significant change that Lynn has talked through. How is it that we have got here? Now my guess is that you and I can all draw on stories uh, about, from our own culture, from our own background, about the significance of our community's elders. In my particular faith tradition, which is the Presbyterian arm of the Uniting Church, what it was that we had at, when I was uh, being raised was, where did you turn to for the wisdom? Where did you turn to for the significance of leadership? It was the Council of Elders. Now, it didn't necessarily mean that the Council of Elders was all made up of old people, but let's face it, the church tends to be more for, made up of old people. And the Council of Elders traditionally was older people. People that were uh, that had wisdom. Yes, as Alistair pointed out, historically it was men as who were older and supposedly the wise ones. We've grown in some ways, but it's still that tradition that is passed on that you listen for the wisdom from the Council of Elders in, in that particular faith tradition. In our First Nations, the centrality of elders is particularly important, and we acknowledge elders past, present and emerging when we uh, commence our times. The importance of the elders in holding and passing on the law of the community can't be overstated. Auntie Denise Champion, that a number of you may well know, Auntie Denise is an Anglo-Methanian woman, she's also the, theologi uh, the theologian in residence at Flinders University. Uh, she's one of the wonderful First Nations peoples who tells the stories of the importance of the respect of older people. And she tells one of the dreaming stories of how the birds that we know as the magpie and the crow, the urukuli and the wakala, got their colour, got their blackness. Ended up with black feathers because in the dreaming story they were originally white. And it was, as the story goes, the consequences from those birds not listening to their elders. And they were caught in fire and in smoke. They didn't pay attention to the warnings of the elders and they were stained forever. It's a powerful story. It's a powerful thing of significance. We are stained forever when we do not respect our elders and listen to the wisdom. What is it that we as a society are now suffering the consequences of if we are not paying that level of respect to the wisdom of our older people. And yet, during the last 12 months of the COVID pandemic, 
the reports in relation to elder abuse around Australia have skyrocketed really significantly. Here in Canberra, it's been reported and recorded well. Uh, the stats coming through from other jurisdictions, Queensland has some very accurate stats and some frightening statistics on the increase in elder abuse, physical, financial, emotional, over the past 12 months. Here in the ACT, the OPAL service that's run by Legal Aid ACT has reported a really significant spike. In some work that I'm currently doing in relation to discrimination, uh, in particular in relation to uh, the review of the Discrimination Act here in the ACT, I've been asking people whether as a society we are getting better at not discriminating. The Act has as one of its objects the progressive realisation of equality. And so I've been asking people, are we getting any better at the moment? Now people from different sectors have had quite different views about it. It's been quite striking that about half the people that I've been speaking to are saying we're getting much better and about half the people are saying we're not getting, in fact we're going worse. Those who were representing our older community have universally said we are getting worse. What is it that is taking place for us to be going backwards in the way that we understand and provide respect, provide the equality for our older people. When I was Attorney General and Minister for Seniors in the previous term of government, as uh, Clive mentioned, I introduced legislation in relation to Australia's first specific uh, uh, criminal provision in relation to elder abuse and the abuse of vulnerable adults. Abuse that could take place individually or institutionally. Seniors groups, leaders across the community here, when I spoke with them about it, their response was, it's about time. Or, of course. There was just no hesitation when I was speaking to our older Canberrans about that particular legislation. It was legislation that was noted in a number of other jurisdictions, and surprisingly to me, I was contacted not only from people around Australia, but from people overseas who are paying very close attention, very warmly to that legislation. But there were other voices, and there were some quite powerful institutional voices in society from people in positions of structural significance who said that we shouldn't be doing it. People who said that shouldn't we just be looking at civil ways or conciliatory ways of dealing with this rather than criminalising the uh, abuse of older people. People who were saying, well, if you criminalise neglect or criminalise the abuse of older people, who will want to be involved in the aged care industry? Can I invite you to pause and think about that response at the moment? If you criminalise, neglect or the abuse of older people, who would want to be involved in the aged care industry? Why is it that we have... How is it that we've got to the point that we would even accept that that's a valid criticism? And it was a very strong criticism at the time. What does it mean for us as a society that throughout the health restrictions of the COVID health emergency, the public health concern for people with particular vulnerabilities has been communicated in a way that our older people have heard it to say, stay at home, it's too dangerous for you to come out at all. And by implication, some of those people have heard your mental health, your connectivity, they're not important. You can't be trusted to balance the risk. It may not have been what was being said, but it was what was being heard. There is that gap there. Is it the case that these days we have deified our youth so much at the expense of, at the expense of respect for elders that society has now got to the point that we've learned the value of young people that maybe a generation or so ago we weren't so good at. We've now learned the value of young people at the expense of the value for older people rather than realising actually respect isn't something you have to take away from one group to offer to another. Why is it that we have got to the stage that it appears that we are neglecting the inherent value and worth of older people in the way that in the past 
we have neglected the value and the worth of younger people? Is it, as Lynn has mentioned, the idea that we need to be economic contributors to society and we define things around what it means to be an economic contributor without even necessarily valuing very well the economic contribution that comes through volunteering. As when I was at uh, Kipax, when and putting in grant applications, I would regularly remind people as we, who were writing the grant applications, start working out what it would cost if all of those volunteers just walked away. So it's monetized in that way and see how it is that it's received. And that gets heard very clearly. But should we have to be heard by talking economic language? It's one language, but is it the most important language for us as a community? Why is it that we've been comfortable with having a national anthem that has celebrated being young and free? Now, we've recently changed that, and it's been primarily around the understanding of us as are we a young nation or not, and what does that say about the 60,000 years of heritage that seem to be ignored by saying young and free. Leave all of that very valid criticism anyway, and say, what does it mean for us to be seeing with great joy that we are young and free? Why is it so important for us to celebrate being young? Now, when I was recently visiting my mother-in-law, who is in her late 80s, she is developing dementia, she commented to me that she was very pleased because she had recently been assessed as being able to get the next level of care for her. Um, it's clearly that her dementia is progressing, and so she was pleased, and she said, the government's doing pretty well because I've been assessed in this, and it's only going to take probably four or five months before the care starts. How is it that we've got to the stage, not just that there would be four or five months delay once you're recognised as being in need of that care and deserving of that care, but that people have come to accept that it's okay that you are in need of that care because you're, you're developing dementia, but wait anyway. What does that mean for our health system? What does that mean for the other services? What does it mean for the quality of life and the value of people? We're in Lent at the moment. What does it mean for us as a society to acknowledge and repent of the fact that around seven or eight years ago, about $2 billion was cut out of the uh, aged care industry. I was chair of the board of Uniting at the time, and we were pretty terrified about what was going on. Providers right across Australia spoke about what would happen when you take that amount of money out of the aged care industry. And what we have seen in the Royal Commission and its recommendations is that we are reaping what we sowed. How is it that we repent of that? What does it mean for us to repent of that and to turn and to change? But what's been going on with people who are older in society that has fed the attitudes that we now have? What has fed the way that people are now hearing and seeing and speaking in relation to older people? I wonder who it is that we find have been the most vocal, vocal in resisting new steps of inclusion of other marginalised groups. Where are the voices that we hear of opposition? Where's the opposition come from for the inclusion of the LGBTIQ community? Where has the opposition come from for the inclusion of First Nations people? More recently, even ongoingly at the moment, where is the opposition coming from? The voices, where are they speaking in relation to the way that women are treated and respected? Where have been the efforts to hold on to structural power, not let it go, and to say, well, it's okay to have a bit more inclusion, but not at the expense of. Yes. If we hold on, if those of us who may be moving on in years hold on to that power, or hold on to what used to be power, what does that do for the way that people 
uh, C in reverse. What does the future look like? Well, what would it look like for a future of value of each person? Of each person being created in the image of God, as my particular faith tradition speaks, as our faith tradition speaks. Uh, Lynn spoke some, about some stats about the number of older people across Australia between here and 2058. 58. 2058. A million is a round number, though. It's so. nice. <laughs> well, let me tell you an, another stat, which is a slightly smaller one, a Canberra-based one. Between mm -hmm. now and 2030, there will be two additional uh, Canberra and suburbs worth of people with Alzheimer's or dementia on top of what we have at the moment. So that's one of the things that drives me in some uh, works and volunteering that I'm doing. Uh, apart from some of my previous work uh, with Uniting and seeing some great examples of how it is that we can think differently about uh, working with living with and caring for people with dementia. At the moment, I'm on the board of a, a group called the Neighbourhood Canberra. And what it's trying to do is reimagine what uh, care of people with dementia might look like. How might it be that we can pick up some of the learnings from uh, the Netherlands, from uh, Scandinavian countries, places uh, such as Rotorua, the village uh, in Rotorua, where people with dementia are not only valued as people in their own right, but, in, but are engaging with life in a way, as Lynn was talking about before, with their language, but with life patterns, with life skills and engaging the community more broadly. There's a way that we now have to rethink, not just from uh, an operational point of view and a financial point of view. I think it's good for us now to be reflecting on what does it mean to be changing the way that we live out our values and affecting cultural change. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Gordon for um, a wonderful uh, challenge to us and uh, the stories that accompany that. I don't think I'll <coughs> ever um, lose that phrase, staying forever by not listening to our elders. I think that was a, a marvellous uh, uh, challenge to uh, our society uh, about respecting uh, our elders in our community. So thank you. Um, we now throw it open to questions. Um, I have uh, received a couple uh, on uh, by uh, by email, and I may start with that uh, as as a first question, <coughs> while uh, you think of uh, of others, and we'll do this by um, people just raising their hand. I think. Uh, you should be able to be heard in the context of this room. But I will repeat the question so that those who are listening by Zoom or watching us by Zoom uh, can hear that, uh, that question. <clears throat> the question relates to, um, and it affects a number of people that are part of our community, who are over 65 and who are disabled. And uh, <clears throat> when the NDIS was introduced, uh, it specifically excluded people who were over 65. Mm -hmm. Can one or either of you comment on the justice of that and whether that can be described as discrimination and how that fits in with the human rights of those people and uh, whether uh, this is an opportunity while they're looking at the response to the Royal Commission for that to be re-examined. Uh, thank you, Clive. So I'll, I'll have a crack at that. Um, so there is a recommendation, in, as I said to you, in the Royal Commission. There's a, a recommendation around um, ensuring that old Australians ineligible for the NDIS can get equivalent... Um, equivalent supports or an equivalent amount of support. Um, I was with Uniting Care Australia when um, we all engaged in 15 to 20 years of advocacy 
to get a national disability insurance scheme. And if, if you remember those of us who were involved, there wasn't an electorate in the country that didn't have the big NDIS voice bubble um, placards. There wasn't a disability community in the country that, um, that wasn't engaged in that, um, that huge amount of advocacy. Um, when, you, when you try to get a, a really new thing up, like superannuation, when Australia hasn't had, had it, or universal access to healthcare, remember once upon a time we didn't have Medicare either, the NDIS, I think, is, is in that sort of tranche of um, social reform for this country. It's a huge, I hope, enduring reform that is radically transforming a lot of people's lives. Um, the reality is though, those, those big things get caught up in um, policy parameters and they do get caught up in politics. And I remember, we were trying to remember as we came in what year the NDIS was announced in the budget and Gordon I think it was 2012, but anyone who wants to Google can contest that, it was around that time. It was just before the election um, where Labor lost government I think. Um, but I remember Jenny Macklin was the minister, Bill Shorten was minister supporting her. They excuse the inelegant language, but they worked their asses off. Jenny mainly running the policy part of it. Bill doing, um, you know, around the country, doing many, many consultations. And at some point you have to put boundaries on things. So when the NDIS, the policy was first being developed, mental health wasn't part of that either. That got shoehorned in, as I recall, right towards the end, with some very able lobbying by Mental Health Council of Australia. I think to the detriment of the NDIS and potentially to the detriment of Australians living with episodic mental ill health because the NDIS was never designed for episodic kind of events. It was really designed for people with a physical impairment or a neurological impairment or, you know, um, the, that was the way disability was being defined. As I recall in all the policy discourse around that at the time, there was a lot of conversation about um, what would be the age boundary if there was going to be one for the NDIS? And um, in the end, I think the pragmatics of the escalating cost of this thing just drove the boundary to be kind of where it is now. Um, and, and the theory was, we'll improve this bit and then we'll go after and improve aged care. So that kind of never really works, <laughs> that theory, but it's a good theory. Um, so in terms of justice, in terms of hope, is it a reason that I, I mean, the answers are really obvious, no, no, and no, but I'm, I'm not sure they're super helpful questions because we don't live in a Bible study world where we can ask those questions and answer them without being pragmatic. So unless everybody listening to this wants to double or triple the tax they're providing into the, the common pot, we just don't have enough money to do all the things we say we want. And as a country, we're pretty shy on stepping up to say, I'm happy to pay more tax. Um, so, so it is what it is. The other thing I would say about the NDIS is it is definitely a plane we're building while flying it. Um, the, the policy settings weren't even finished when it was announced in the budget. And we're still working out how to, how to fly the plane. Um, currently the plane is being hugely weighted down by more and more micro-regulations. So we need, to, we need to shift that as well. My hope is that um, as we focus as a nation now on ageing and, and the aged care space, we can lift the, um, the choices that um, citizen consumers can make in that space. We can lift the capability of that system and it's flexibly to actually wrap around people and meet their needs. Um, so it doesn't have to be an argument between the NDIS and aged care. Um, and most, well not most important, but equally importantly, we will have to pay attention to the interface between the aged care system and the NDIS so that people can smoothly transition between. Um, my hope is as a country we would um, start to um, value in our budget um, social services, health services, support services, disability services, aged care services as much as we um, value our defence force services which we also need. I don't know if you know this up to about 10 or 12 years ago, defence used to back a truck up to the budget chuck in all the bullion and drive away and defence really wasn't unpacked in the budget at all for decades in this country. So imagine if we could do that for um, human services, wouldn't that be nice? Mm. <laughs> we'll take it all, thanks. Mm. Thanks. Did you want to say anything? No. 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 Okay. Over to you and please uh, ask some questions. Yes.
Um, my question is that I think um, we're talking in a way different languages because on the one hand, many of us are talking about valuing people as human beings and um, putting people's needs first. But we're living in an economy which puts um, profits and productivity first and um, judges most things um, by cost. And we're also living in an economy where um, I remember back to the 50s and 60s where we were actually able to build things which are now considered too expensive. And um, I think since that time we've had a tremendous increase in inequality, which is what neoliberalism has produced, and we're getting close to what Galbraith called um, private affluence public squalor, which is part of the reason I suspect that we can't afford to do all the things that we should do. Um, and we have built into our system um, uh, in, uh, inherited inequality. We don't, we don't uh, tax assets. They are passed on. So we are, we're moving into a period of inherited wealth and of people of, uh, who have inherited wealth being able to afford to pay for good services and for much of the rest of the country having to make do um, with whatever the budget feels it can spare. So I think that we, we've, um, we've come to a point where we're talking different languages. We have all these people, uh, and when you talk about efficiency, productivity, we have tremendously um, productive older people, advocates, volunteers, and they put so much time and effort into preparing reports, preparing submissions, only to find that most of, it, most of their work is ignored. And the same with academic input. Um, how many academics have we got who've been warning about climate change? But it's too expensive. And their work comes to nothing and is blocked. So although we should be, theoretically, one of the most intelligent, well-informed societies that have ever been seen, we're not, because um, the knowledge and wisdom of experts and old people and volunteers comes to very little, because it always um, founders on the rock of um, the bottom line. And so uh, this is how I feel anyway, that. Um, our society is not working. It's pulling in different directions. <clears throat> Look, perhaps if I could very briefly summarise, and thank you for that question. Um, does uh, neoliberalism, with its privileging of uh, efficiency, profit, cost, productivity, uh, and... Crony uh, capitalism. And, and um, uh, inequality, how does that sit then with uh, where this discussion needs to go um, as a society uh, in terms of providing less um, inequality and support for those in need? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think there's obviously a, a lot there to unpack and to deal with for a while. A couple of responses. I think it's important for us who believe that there are um, other values that need to be heard clearly. Our responsibility is to make sure they're heard. Uh, we, are, we are a group of uh, people who can think things through and can speak in different ways. As Minister for the Arts, uh, I used to say to our artists all the time, you have to learn to speak about three different languages. You have to learn to speak the language of creativity, 
You have to learn to speak the language of economics. You have to learn to speak the language of inclusion. You have to learn to speak the language of participation. And you have to know where it is that you are speaking or how it is that you are being heard as to what it is that you say or at least in what ways. I do not believe that it is the case, for example, that the arts are unimportant economically, but the arts are not very good at speaking economic language. I don't believe it's the case in any way that our values of social inclusion and uh, participation are either unimportant or unable to be heard in ways that speak to the economy, but we don't speak that language well enough. We, it's up to us who want to make impacts to learn to speak the language that helps that impact happen. Um, and for those of us who are in position, who have the privilege of being in positions of leadership, we have to at times do that translating. One simple example, uh, you may well know that the ACT government has recently chosen to have a well-being budget in addition to a financial budget where it uh, defines things not in terms of the traditional outputs that are measurable on financial widgets here and there, but actually what happens in terms of a whole range of other things. It's picked up the model from uh, New Zealand, which has been doing it for a number of years now. We can start to do that, and I think there are very good signs of, of a change that's happening, but the change doesn't just happen by itself. It is a significant uh, piece of work that needs to keep happening, but we can't ignore the financial side of things. We have to be able to speak to it and around it and through it as well. Okay, no one's going to be more surprised than me at this. I'm going to enter into a spirited defence of economists <laughs> God save me, and the economy. I, um, life is often more complex than we would like to think it is, and it's more like, no, I, I like to speak and say, let's put on our t-shirts, it'll be like a t-shirt slogan, but actually, you can't live your life and you can't manage or lead in complexity um, through t-shirts so I can say they're good for conference speeches. Um, so when I think why does the economy matter and why does it matter that we think about the economy and why does it matter that we have trained economists? I don't love that economists are gone at the moment and I think it's one, as Gordon says, it's one really important foundational professional language but there are others. You know, the language of philosophy, the language of theology, the language of the arts, the language of social policy. Um, I've, in the last probably 10, 15 years, I've spent a bit of time in New Zealand and I've just finished, or finished phase one of a huge project looking at leadership across Australia and New Zealand. So I've been thinking about our, comparing our two countries. It's really easy to look at New Zealand and the Ardern phenomena, and I'm a big fan girl of Jacinda's. Don't get me wrong, I think she's a phenomenal global leader. Um, New Zealand's economy is nothing like Australia. New Zealand's live with at least, I can't remember the exact, it's something like 20% lower standard of living, maybe more than Australians. Children are, will die this calendar year in New Zealand of pleurisy. No one's going to die in Australia of pleurisy this year. Public housing in New Zealand often has water streaming down the walls. It's so mm -hmm. poorly constructed and they can't afford um, to fix it. So the standard of living stuff matters. Um, because we pay attention to our economy, because we make hard choices, we've been able to bring in superannuation, Medicare, the NDIS, an aged care system that while we've just talked about how kind of shonky and overwhelmed and in need of reform it is, it's still working way better than any Horn of Africa country that I can think of, you know, or way better than most countries in the world. Um, I can't remember, two or three weeks ago, I was down at the beach and my retina started detaching. I made a phone call to a doctor, I got advice, I got in the car, drove myself home. Might not have been the most sensible thing to do, but that was the fastest way to do it. And I went, walked straight into Canberra Hospital and within 15 minutes of being in that building, I was having laser surgery and my sight's fine. I don't know another country in the world where that could happen. It couldn't happen in, the, in America, it wouldn't happen in the UK. So I think, I think it's, it's a complex issue. You know, I know a lot of public sector economists, I am in fact married to one, um, and I don't know a single person in the public sector in this country who works in economics who isn't as committed to the common good and to public value as I am or as you are. I argue with them all the time about um, policy priorities and what we need to focus on. And they give as good as they get and they make some really good cases. So I think, I think 
democracy is strongest when we, we, we come together and we, we have a systems leadership kind of approach. We speak our different languages. We engage in robust debate. We're not afraid to disagree with each other and we keep arguing because all of us want what's best for all of us. And, and in that debate, that's the great engine room of democracy. In that debate, hopefully, we find productive and um, optimising pathways forward. So do I think that um, a lot of privatisation is a great thing in public services? I think sometimes it's been a really good thing and sometimes it's been a desperately bad thing and most of the time it's been a pretty mixed thing. Thank you. Yes. 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 This is Roger Beale, Lynn. Um, you might remember. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I yes. Yes, Roger. Please ask your question. Don't ask a detailed question of me, Roger Beale. <laughs> I didn't get a good answer to the question at all. Uh, Lynn, we look after the disabled that we personally care about. Yes. Under 65 to continue uh, to get NDIS after their 65. That group that was disabled and under 60 and over 65 is inevitably an overall and I a diminishing group. But we thought it was just too hard to fund them. Uh, in terms of justice, uh, Somebody earns 65 the day after they fall down the staircase, break their neck, bad luck. Now, Lynn, as the Christian you are, and as the wife of a very ethical economist, <laughs> as I you are, Steve. <laughs> how do they go after that? And tell Steve how you are to this time. <laughs> <laughs> So Roger, in terms of justice, I don't think you can, I don't think we can make the case that the current policy settings are just, they're not just. Um, I suppose the point, I'm not arguing that and I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to diminish the, um, the really tough impacts on people and the shitty impacts on people. I guess I would just say though, I can't think of an arena of social policy where I couldn't make an example like that, you know, because because at some point public policy puts boundaries on things and at some point um, policy advisors, public servants will put boundaries on advice, they pass up the chain to, to politicians. Um, politicians will put boundaries on advice they're prepared to hear. Climate change and the weaponising of that has been a fantastic example in this country for at least the last 15 years. Um, and so it isn't fair, the NDIS issue, and, and, and maybe in an NDIS reform we could actually look at that issue. So um, I wouldn't be opposed to looking at those issues around the edges, but it's just, if you get, if there's a, and you know this, if, if there's like a hectare of issues around the edges, where do you draw the line? And where do you say, well, we could fix the NDIS, but we can't do anything about aged care? Which is why I suppose I made that that um, I had a jab at defence, which never seems to go wanting for money. Um, so it, it's tough. Can I, can I just add to Robert's question? Yeah. Um, It's not only unfair, it's also unlawful. 
And it's completely absurd because you take two people who have had lost a leg, so they've got two amputees, both of their right leg is kids. One was 64, the brother got, got in, one was 65, didn't get in. Five years later, you've got two 65 year olds, amputees, uh, one in, one out. The, the whole thing is, I've, I've, I've lost that too much burden in my mind today, and, and, and really, uh, if, it's, if it is so unfair, surely then it becomes imperative to, to fix it, which is, we can do by simply repealing Section 22 of the NDIS Act. So that's, that's an incredibly good question. Um, do you... Did we need to draw a line? Um, I, I wasn't working in the public sector at the time, so I just, I don't know what the parameters were that people were playing off against each other. Um, in my experience in social policy, very rarely do people ask the question, do we need to draw a line? Um, so it is a foundational question. Um, it is, I mean, what you've described is massively unfair. Um, sadly, I can't see I can't see a government in the near future, in the next few budgets, looking at reforming NDIS that way. The reforms currently seem to be trending to how do we cut costs and how do we um, regulate, and in my view we're moving way, well towards over-regulation, micro-regulation of a scheme that was supposed to put choice and control in the hands of um, Australians living with disability. So, I think your question is a really good one and I, I can't give you an answer because I wasn't providing the advice or making the decisions. Um, but yes, if it's a small cohort of people being impacted, why wouldn't you <coughs> fix that so that the scheme lives more fully up to its promise? And certainly if this was, God, no, I've come out of NGO world, if this was an NGO and we were on the board, that's the kind of thing that a good board would look at and remediate. Can I um, just say, I'm actually extremely tired of fighting. I'm sick of fighting for my parents' rights. Mm -hmm. I'm sick of fighting for my clients' rights who are NDIS clients. I am sick of fighting for my own rights as a cancer patient, especially here in the ACT. I've got to the stage now where I just want to give up, but I can't. It's just not working. We need to start kicking butt and forgetting about people's sensibilities and start putting people first. Can I um, say one of the one of the most powerful scenes from the movie that I have seen is actually a scene that didn't make it into the final cut of the movie. Um, and it's a movie that is about um, people who were engaging in, in the Vietnam War at the time and it's, prior, and it's around the families that were left behind. And it's at one stage, uh, the wives of the soldiers, as they were, were going to um, a chapel, and the person who was meant to be singing was the wife of someone who was in the battle at the time that they were offering uh, prayers in relation to. She went to sing, and nothing would come out of her mouth. Absolute silence. Um, and when she didn't sing, another person in the congregation started singing for her. And then soon you had the entire congregation, except for the person who was supposed to be doing the solo, doing the solo. What it says to me is it's the role of the church to provide the voice for those people who have run out of voice. It is really important for us as a society to make sure when people are running out of energy, are too tired, have been worn down, that there are others of us who are ready to keep the voice going. Fundamentally important for us as a community, fundamentally important for us as a community of faith. Um, yes, Hazel. Sorry, there's a couple of questions online. Right. Um, sorry, I've just got to find it again now. Why not hire why not have higher care for aged as a part of the NDIS? And another person asked, um, so what can we see from the um, commission and how is that going to help? So they're, they're great. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, hired care for the NDIS. And the second, in a nutshell, Hazel, is 
from the, from looking at the commission, how do we actually see anything happening? What's going to happen? How's it going to help? For the NDIS? No, for the aged care. For aged care. Sorry, two questions, one for NDIS, one for... The second question is, uh, what are likely to be the outcomes, holistic outcomes, from the Commission's report? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think any of us outside in the circle of, um, of um, budget engaged people would know that. But I think I would be surprised if the Australian Government at this point uh, accepted all the recommendations, for example, because they're, they're really far-reaching. You know, so there are a couple that even I balked at when I was telling you, you know, I really think government's going to